Hi, and welcome to the Norfolk Southern Asheville District in HO scale. Today I want to take some time to give you a tour of the layout. Over the past several months, I've been able to share a lot of different aspects and components of the layout individually, but I really wanted to give you a detailed, in-depth tour from point A to point B on the layout and share a little bit of information about why we model what we do and a couple other interesting aspects about the layout itself. This is my father and I's layout and we can't take the sole credit for it. A lot of friends in the hobby have been very generous to help us out. So a big thanks to them, and I'm really excited to share it with you today. So let's go ahead and get started. The layout itself is a prototype freelance layout that's located in a room that's about 24 by 24 feet with a few odd cutouts here and there. It's a double-decker layout on the outside of the room, so we have an upper level height of about 60 inches and a lower level height of about 36 inches or 3 feet, and then some hidden staging underneath as well. In the middle of the room, we have a peninsula, which is actually a climb that connects the two levels, but we'll get to that later. So real quick, I wanted to give you a quick walk around of the layout just so you can get an overall idea for how this fits into the room and how the layout is designed. And while we're doing that, I'm gonna talk about some general information and facts about the layout, and then we'll hop into some details and follow the main line from point A to point B. But in the meantime, this is an HO scale layout. It was started about 15 years ago, and it's really fun to go back and watch some of my old videos on this layout when it was really just cork and plywood. And it's been fun to kind of watch the progression myself over the years and been really fun to share it with you guys. We use Atlas Code 100 track and Pico switches. The maximum mainline grade is 2.6% and the minimum radius on the main lines is 36 inches. And I think it's about 36 inches on the siding and yards as well. We use Digitracks to control the layout. You can see the cabinet there in the bottom of your screen and I'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end of the video. And we also have operating signals and track detection on the layout, which is run by CATS, which is a program that piggybacks off of JMRI. Again, I'll talk more about that later in the video. And the last thing I wanted to mention is that the layout is loosely modern in the sense that um, it is modern, but we do like to see and keep around some of the old power like the Norfolk Southern top hats and some of the old signals, which are quickly disappearing on the Norfolk Southern system today. So that's a quick flyby of the layout and a little bit of information for you. So now let's go ahead and start our detailed tour back at the yard at Asheville. Welcome to Asheville Yard. We're at the east end of Asheville Yard. We're gonna come back to this in a little bit, but the first thing we're gonna do is follow the S line. We have several different lines which branch off and diverge from this yard, and this is really the center point of the railroad. So we're gonna follow each one individually, but we're gonna start with the S line. That is kind of the uh, main line of the, of the layout, so to speak, with the most scenery and the longest run, and one of our favorites. So here at the control point at Biltmore, the S line branches off um, from the two main lines, which are actually a continuous loop around the lower level. And we designed it that way so that we can continuously run trains and it's double track all the way around the lower level so that we can run two trains in opposite directions or in the same direction, just let them run and not have to worry about switching tracks or um, stopping them and reversing direction if we need to. So we'll come back and look at those in a little bit, but there in the background, which is the track branching off with the uh, more gray colored ballast, that is the S line. And here at the control point at Biltmore, as soon as it branches off, it begins a 2.6% grade all the way to the upper level. So it's a steep grade with lots of tight curves, really quite a challenge for heavy trains to get up the hill. Immediately here, just a little bit east of the control point at Biltmore, there's a nice little farmhouse and the track is already climbing as you can see. In the foreground, a couple modern buildings like a Starbucks, a Taco Bell and a gas station. And then in the middle of the scene, we've modeled a modern passenger station. This is very typical of a lot of the passenger stations that you'd see today with the yellow and green siding and white trim, and then the gray roof, and of course the classic Southern caboose modeled next to the station as well. And here we have a really neat intersection scene. I'm really excited to finish this. We're actually gonna be adding working traffic lights and hopefully we're gonna be able to tie those into the um, operating gates as well. We haven't quite figured out how we're gonna do it yet, but I have a couple friends, and one of them being Grayson, who's really helped us out with a lot of electronics on this layout, um, and a lot of the signals. Um, we've been talking about a couple ideas and bouncing stuff off each other. So that's something that's coming soon, really excited to get that going, and hopefully shouldn't be too hard. So again, following the main line here in the background, we'll come back to the main lines on the lower level um, in a little bit, but for now, the tracks in the background, the S line goes through its first set of signals. The entire S line is ABS, or it's automatic block signals, and it's in real life controlled by track authorities. 
and the signals are always green unless a train is around. It's really an extra safety measure. So that set of signals was the uh, signals of Magnolia. They duck behind the coal mine here. Again, we'll come back to that. Come out for a few feet and then go back into another tunnel. And actually on the other side of this wall, there's a really neat scene. This is the snow scene. And we've set it on the other side of the peninsula so that it really separates it. That way it doesn't look like your train is going into a tunnel in summer, out in winter, and then back out into summer. This really separates the scene, sets it apart, and we always wanted to model a snow scene, but this is a great way to do it uh, kind of in a picture frame scene. Um, so we've modeled it a couple of feet deep, it's about three feet wide and about a foot high. So just perfect, real great way to get some winter scenery on the layout, but to separate it from the rest of the layout in a neat way. After the snow scene, the tracks go behind the workbench and then come out of the tunnel into the loops of Old Fort. If you want to know more about the loops, check out a few of my previous videos. I have a little bit of information specifically on this section of track in real life and how we've modeled it here on the layout. However, I wanted to talk a little bit about it while we're here, and you can see this is our rendition, so even though it's not an exact replica of the old fort loops due to space constraints, we did model it and really capture the feel of it well. So at the end of the peninsula, we had a huge trestle, and one thing my dad and I really wanted to do as we designed this layout was Instead of really separating the room and separating the two different scenes, we thought it would be really cool to have a really um, deep scene with a lot of depth and model of valley, something that you don't see very often. So a little bit different, but definitely fun to model. Here we have a little access road, and these are the signals of Coleman. This is actually a prototype location on the loops of Old Fort, which we've modeled here. In real life, it's a siding. However, due to space constraints, we didn't model that specific siding. And like I said, it is a prototype freelance layout. So even though a lot of the names and locations that you'll see on the layout, and even some of the scenes are modeled exactly after the prototype, the layout as a whole is loosely based and loosely modeled after what we see in real life. Here's a nice little bridge, again, very representative. This is exact scene can be found on the old Fort Loops and just a good example of what I just mentioned. The trees that we use on the layout are super trees. They're made by Scenic Express and they're kits in the sense that you have to put each and every tree together and put all the foliage on the tree. So it's a lot of work, but definitely worth it and looks good once you get all the trees on. We're not quite done. As you can see on the right side of the track here, um, we do need to add a few more trees um, on the other side of the cut. We also have a rock fence, which is modeled after a few of the ones we've seen in the old fort loops. And then we cross a big trestle here. This is a really neat river scene with lots of kudzu, very typical of the eastern mountains. And uh, here in the middle of the valley, we have a little T with a road that goes off to the left and over the river. We also have a little country store and rafting station. So once we get water in the river, there will be rafters and we have a nice rafting bus there as well. Again, um, that was made by my dad. So a lot of the structures and bridges and um, even the scenery you'll see on this layout was done uh, by my dad, both of us together, but he's really a master craftsman at a lot of the buildings and things you'll see on this layout. And coming back up to the tracks here on the trestle, this is really the centerpiece and the end of the peninsula. Here as we continue around the mountains and as it curves and continues the 2.6% grade, it catches up with the road, which we saw back there at the T, which is in the valley. And it parallels the road for just a little bit. On the other side is an industry. I'll talk about that in a moment. And we cross over the road, which is an operating crossing gate here. And again, we need a few more trees and a little bit more details to finish this scene. But as a whole, it's probably 90 to 95% done. So the uh, industry here is the first one that you'll get to coming up the S line. And this is a forest products industry. So it loads some wood chips and it also is going to be loading some box cars as well. So the wood chip cars can be taken up to the paper plant, which we'll get to in just a little bit. And then the box cars will return to Asheville for routing elsewhere on the Norfolk Southern system. So just a couple little uh, spur tracks here. The one in the foreground can hold a couple of box cars. And then the one in the background can hold two wood chip cars. And then obviously those would be switched out by a local, which is based out of Asheville. Continuing eastbound up the hill, the train um, kind of goes over what our, is our rendition of High Fill. This is where there was a valley in real life and the railroad just filled it in with dirt and gravel and rock to really make its way across. A neat uh, way to do it instead of a bridge and something that if you look up pictures of the old Fort Loops is very representative of what they've done there. Here is our uh, second industry on the S-Line. However, this time the lead is actually facing westbound, so trains will 
have to go up, turn around on the siding, and then switch this industry on the way back down the mountain. This is a cement plant, and it takes cement cars, gravel cars, and sand cars, kind of depending on what the industry needs. But uh, the first couple spots of this track are going to be for cement cars. It's where they're going to unload the cement powder with, I believe, air pressure is how they do it in real life, and then mix it into the cement trucks, which will go out to the construction sites and wherever else they need it. And then there's a little bridge track there on the end to unload gravel and sand. As we continue eastbound up the hill, we cross over another bridge and again continuing to parallel the road, but this time it's on the other side of the tracks. The railroad, which is a little bit higher than the track, ducks through a cut there and then enters the town of Growstone. This is also where it meets up with the uh, continuous loop main line here on the upper level, and as I mentioned, we can run it as a point to point or we can run it as a loop if we just want to let trains run. So that is where the uh, loop track, so to speak, kind of branches off and you can continue to really run around the upper level. Or we could run it as a point to point and kind of just pretend that doesn't exist. However, here in the foreground, uh, just a little bit about the scenery. This is a little maintenance away facility where uh, track crews can kind of store a lot of equipment and whatever else they need. And then here in the background is the town of Growstone. It is actually more loosely modeled after Saluda. You'll notice some representations there as well. However, we know to call it Grovestone just because it's where we've seen a lot of trains meet in real life and it's a neat sighting that we have here on the upper level. So these are the signals of West Grovestone. In real life, the switches are spring switches. And these are really interesting switches where if you're going into the siding, you'll have to throw it. However, if a train is leaving the siding onto the main line, they don't have to throw it. The switch points actually have springs in them and they will just bounce back and forth as a train exits the siding. And one little side note, I actually tried to model the spring switches in HO scale. I tried using some micro springs, those didn't work. I tried using some weights and counterweights underneath to kind of, you know, pull the spring and the switch points to the side, but unfortunately nothing works. It was just too much of a difference between the weight of the engines and then how light some of the cars were, even when they were proper, properly weighted with NMRA standards, we just couldn't get it to work. It was more of a hassle, so we ended up taking all that out and putting a tortoise switch machine in and it works great now. So anyways, the track goes in front of the door there. I'll talk more about the swing bridge, which I just showed you. It goes over a trussle and another river here, over a private crossing. And um, I meant to say this earlier, but the main line is in the background and the siding is in the foreground. We now transition into a little bit of a different scene, continuing with the siding, but this time we're going in front of the window. And this is actually really nice in the room. During the daytime, whatever season it is, it's just nice to have some really good natural light coming into the room. It's great for videos, photography, and just if you're working in here, it's nice to have a little bit of natural light as well. Here are the signals at East Grove Stone. Again, it's a spring switch in real life, but not on the model. But uh, we have our nice set of signals here. You'll notice they're set up a little bit differently. However, they're set up exactly like the sightings you'd find on the S-Line, both signal and switch configuration-wise. So back into single main track here, going through a little bit more mountain and mountainous scenes. And we need to install the rest of the super trees here, but we do have a little bit of it done here in the corner and a really neat little cabin scene, which uh, my dad built yeah, a year or two ago, with a little outhouse, an old truck, and even a little chair to sit on the rock and watch the trains go by. So neat little details here, and we'd really enjoy kind of sharing some of these little details with guests whenever they come over and trying to see if they can find them. As the tracks exit the tunnel underneath the cabin, they then continue into mountainous scenery. And again, like I said, it'll look really good once we have a little bit more trees on here. They then go through a little scene here with an access road and a rail greaser. This was actually completely scratch built. The rail greaser was, and I have a how-to video on it. If you want to go back and look at some of the older videos, I have a lot of different videos on how we built different parts of this layout. And real quick, this scene here with the cement bridge and the tunnel and then the custom support on the other side of the tunnel are actually modeled exactly after scenes found just a little bit west of Old Fort on the prototype. So you'll see these in the Old Fort loops. And that tunnel right there was the very highest point of the railroad. It continues to climb a little bit after the siding at uh, Grovestone. And here it's descending into the town of Old Fort. At Old Fort, we have our last set of intermediate signals on the S line here. We also have the yard limit sign, which indicates the yard limits for the paper mill yard. We'll take a look at that in a minute. But uh, a road comes up to the tracks here, and this is Main Street, which the tracks cross over. There's a set of working crossing gates and an old renovated southern station, kind of like the one I showed you before in Asheville. 
We also have a few buildings here in another part of the town, and then in the background is the paper mill. We'll take a closer look at that in a minute. But this is a really fun building. We actually cut it in half, and my dad put some carpet down, some 3D printed furniture like a pool table, a piano, and then chairs and a dance floor upstairs. So kind of a cool venue, hotel, whatever it is, but uh, very cool. And then appropriately named is the Chip View Barbecue, located just across the tracks from the wood chip unloading part of the paper mill. So that building in the background uh, will unload loaded wood chip cars. Now we don't use live loads for the wood chips, but uh, we do simulate the unloading process and we'll remove the loads and then take the cars back to Asheville empty. Here at the west end of the yard is a little maintenance away facility and engine terminal. The foreground track is a storage stub -in track. And then the track with the darker colored gray ballast is the main line. The two tracks behind that with the SD40-2s and then the box cars are some storage and yard tracks. The track behind that is the runaround track and then branching off of the runaround are several different tracks which go into the paper mill itself. Again, like I mentioned previously, we have the wood chip unloading track. This is the main mill and packaging facility which takes empty box cars, loads them up with paper products and then ships them out. And then this will be the power plant off to the left here as well. This is what powers the facility and um, in our minds the surrounding town as well. So this train will take coal cars and like I mentioned previously, actually just underneath this part of the layout, we have an operating coal mine and coal loader. So trains will come up the hill loaded, uh, empty the trains here at the mine with the operational rotary dumper. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Also associated with the paper mill up here are a few more tracks which serve the industry, some tank cars and then some covered hoppers as well, which will unload materials that are necessary for the paper making process. Here at the end of the yard, the runaround comes back into the main line and that just about wraps up our tour of the upper level. We'll head back to Asheville and pick up our tour there. So back at Asheville, we can take a little closer look at the yard now. It's an eight track yard with a run around in the foreground of the scene. And then the background, we have the two main tracks. Now it's kind of organized in different ways. The unit trains and long freight trains will usually take the outside tracks of the yard or the tracks farthest to the back. Whereas more of the classification tracks and sorting tracks are in the foreground. And then again, we have the run around here in the front. Uh, the main lines in the background go through a set of intermediate signals. That is the, uh, the signals of Mitchell. So again, that's a prototype location in the middle of Asheville Yard, which has a set of signals. And then just behind that is our rendition of kind of the Virginia Transportation Museum that we've kind of called it the Carolina Transportation. Again, we've used a little bit of our modeling license and creative freedom here to kind of create the scene like we wanted it to, but a really neat museum there with some old Norfolk and Western steam engines that we could run on the layout as well. Coming to the other end of the yard, we see the control point of Russell. This is where uh, the yard tracks again come into the main line. And if we could do one thing about this layout differently, I think it would be to add some yard leads. That way when you're switching, uh, the trains can pull onto the yard lead and not have to foul the main tracks. So not a huge deal, but one of those things looking back, if we could do it again, that's something we would do differently. So here at uh, the control point of Russell, we also have a signal bridge. Funny thing, this is actually modeled exactly after a signal bridge in Biltmore, which is on the other side of the yard in real life, but it fit the scene well here. And like I said, it really just captures the feel of the area. We're not going for an exact replica of Asheville and of the Asheville yard. Moving west out of Asheville on the double main tracks, we first go over the swing bridge. This is how you actually enter and exit the room. You can see the door to the room just behind us here. But to access and open the swing bridge, you need to first pull out the pin. That's just made out of some parts which we picked up at a local hardware store. It swings open and it's actually hinged on some piano hinges here. So pretty simple operations there. And then again, this was totally designed by my dad. So really excellent woodworking and um, some nice craftsmanship. If I say so myself on the door, he really did a nice job. But it swings open. We have the track nailed down and really glued down very well to help it align itself. And then the geometry of the wood as well helps the track align itself as the door closes to prevent expansion and contraction. We also have these four kill switches that uh, whenever the door is open, those switches are open and it cuts the track power up to this point here on the west side of the bridge. And then it cuts it up to the control point just a little bit past the signals on the east side of the control or on the east side of the bridge, excuse me. So whenever the door is open, the track power is cut and you don't have to worry about trains going off the end of the layout whenever the bridge is open or even cracked because the track power won't work. So as you can see, when the bridge is uh, closed, the tracks line up, they duck under a little bridge here, and then we go into one part of the layout, which is actually not very finished. We still have to add the uh, ground scenery, the trees, and a lot of work here, but uh, 
like I said, it's a work in progress. The layout's never done, so lots of work to do. But uh, this is Murphy Junction. This is where the main lines go into a tunnel and then come back out on the other side near the coal mine. And then this is also where the W line branches off from the two main lines on the lower level. The W line goes into a separate tunnel and goes again into the peninsula, but this time it's underneath. We'll take a look at that in a minute. Um, but this is a separate control point. It goes kind of underneath the layout behind the snow scene and then comes out here at the control point of Beaumont. Here is where one leg of the reversing loop branches off to the left. The track in the foreground is the main line, which goes down to the lower level staging. And then the middle track there is the yard lead for another yard here. This is again a small staging yard and really a point of operations where we store and uh, unload ethanol trains and then also a little automobile manufacturer, kind of like a BMW plant that's found near Spartanburg. That takes auto parts, boxcars in, and then the second track from the back uh, ships automobiles out in auto racks. Here, the foreground tracks divide. The track on the right is the other leg of the reversing loop. This is the control point of Del Rio. And then the track that branches off to the left actually goes all the way down and underneath the staging. It loops around under the layout several times, back across the swing bridge door, and then underneath Asheville Yard is some more hidden staging. Like I mentioned, this is a small yard mainly for ethanol trains and automobile parts and auto racks. So a neat little facility here. Still some work to do here. Eventually this will all be scenic and finished, but for now, um, just the track and, and some basic structures mocked up here. The tracks then duck into a tunnel to really kind of highlight the scene above it. We didn't want too much track visible here. And it comes out on another scene here. This is probably one of the thinnest and uh, shortest scenes on the layout. Um, but definitely a favorite with another industry here on the reversing loop as well. We have a small uh, fixed indication signal, so this is always yellow. It just tells train crews approaching the next control point to slow down, uh, expecting a red signal at the next control point. We also have a small little uh, just hardware facility and um, storage area here with some cinder blocks and bags of whatever you might find or need at a hardware store. And then an old crossing here with, again, some tracks which were modeled after tracks that were ripped out and some ties there along the ground as well. So just a neat scene here modeled after a lot of crossings we've seen in the prototype. Moving around the reversing loop we have a couple little industries here. The first one takes rail cars. This is a transloading facility which oftentimes unloads coil cars, tank cars, or anything that can be unloaded on a general spur. Behind that is a little potato chip manufacturer with a funny sign. Again kudos to my dad for creating that but uh, nice job with that one. So the tracks, after going through this scene, duck under the peninsula, go back across it to the other side, and go back to the main lines of Beaumont. Next, I wanted to briefly talk about coal operations on the layout. This is a really big aspect of the railroad, and I won't talk too much about it because I do have several separate videos on the operations itself, but I did want to briefly show it to you. We have an operating flood loader down here on the lower level that loads coal cars, which then go up the hill on the S line, and then dump into the operational rotary dumper up top. That is completely scratch built. It's loosely based on a Walther's kit for some parts here and there, but for the most part, it's scratch built. My friend Grayson designed and put all the components together with an Arduino based system. So you push one button, it completely unloads itself. But I won't talk too much about that here because I have a lot of separate videos on how this works. It then dumps the coal into a hopper here, which is made out of brass. And then we have several different components of this operation, like a vibrator, which helps things flow better and a couple other different neat aspects and design features of this system, which uh, brings the coal back into the flood loader. Here you can see we use a tortoise switch machine, which opens and closes the chute and loads the cars. So those cars will go into Asheville Yard on separate mine runs. The train will then be assembled, or you can load a whole train at once. It'll then get helpers and some extra power to go up the hill, but I'll include that video in a link in the description. You can check out more about the operations there. Lastly, I wanted to talk about the CTC signaling system on the layout, which uses CATS and JMRI software and Digitrax hardware. Just like the real thing, you can click on a switch and the switch on the layout will throw. You can then use the pointer to click on a signal icon and the computer will automatically generate the correct signal indication for the route that you've lined, just like the real thing. So very prototypical operations here, and I'll talk more about that in future videos. Also wanted to mention the layout control, it's a Digitrack Super Chief, and everything is tied into one power switch. So when you flip on that switch, you can turn on the layout lights if you're running at daytime. It turns on the power districts, the amp meters, the booster, and everything is tied into this one switch, which is very nice. 
The entire control system is actually on a panel that slides out for easy access so you can get to some of the wiring underneath. And then you can also turn off separate parts of the layout at once. That's why we have four different districts. So that just about wraps up this layout tour, guys. I wanted to thank you for your time and for watching. It was a privilege to share it with you, and I know I didn't cover everything, but there's a lot of other videos on my channel that cover different aspects of the layout, operations, and how we built it. So thanks for your time, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.